Hey, this is Dan from MSS Enduralis. Welcome to the channel. You don't know anything about what's coming. Let's talk about accidents. Robert has just fallen off his bicycle here. Now, if he was in the middle of the street, scene safety is paramount here. You need to make sure that the scene is safe before you approach Robert here laying in the street. So you need to be aware of traffic and other people as well. Now, we don't typically move people that have fallen off their bicycles with possible neck injuries. But in a case where this was a busy street, you would want to move Robert out of the street right away. If you have several people that can help you, that's great. If you don't, you have to move this person because the scene has to be safe. So in this case, we look at something called AVPU. When we walk up to somebody, AVPU, the A stands for are they alert? So if I go up and I see this person and I introduce myself and they talk to me, they're alert. V is, or do they have response to voice? Maybe they don't acknowledge me, but when I talk, they can move around, that's voice. P is response to pain, and that is they may be unconscious, but when I rub them in the sternum here or I pinch them up here, that they move when I do that. And then U is unresponsive. If they're unresponsive, we need to do a quick assessment and find out what's going on with them. They may have head injuries. They may have leg injuries. Another priority that we need to do in an accident like this is look for bleeding. We can come up and hold Robert's head. We can go down and look what's going on with all the bruises. But if we see bleeding, we're going to address that right away because somebody can bleed to death pretty quick. So you need to address that as soon as you get on scene. So here, I'm going to approach the scene. I'm going to make sure the scene is safe. And the first thing I want to do is because he may have been hit by a vehicle, he may have fallen off his bicycle, my main concern is, is that he might have a head injury or a neck injury. So when I first approach Robert here, I'm going to come up and I'm going to tell him who I am. Hey Robert, my name is John. I'm a paramedic. I can help you. And I'm going to hold on to his head. If somebody's wearing a helmet, there's no reason to remove it. It may be helping hold his, his brain hair in. So we want to leave the helmet on. If, we, if there's bleeding and you have to remove the helmet or you have to do CPR on somebody, then you may need to remove it. But right now, I'm going to hold his head inside this helmet. I'm going to ask him if he can hear me. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Robert? Yeah. Yes. Okay, what happened to you? I fell off my bike and got run over. He fell off his bicycle and he's been hit by a vehicle. And asking those questions, they may be basic questions, but they let me know that he's alert and that he's, that he's, um, he's doing well. He's doing pretty good. I'm going to be looking how he's breathing, see if he's breathing fast, if he's sweating. When somebody goes into shock, they're going to be sweating and they're going to be breathing really fast. And so we need to address that, and I'll address that in just a few moments. So I'm going to look down at Robert and see if there's any bleeding. I don't see anything right now, but again, if there was, I would address that immediately. I have somebody else that can help me, and I'm going to have Stephanie hold Robert's head here. Now, I've sent somebody to call 911. If you're alone and you have to call 911, you'll have to leave him. You'll have to tell him to keep his head steady. You don't want them to move their head back and forth because it might make the injury worse. But now I have another person here, another rescuer, that can help hold Robert's head, and then I can start a head-to-toe assessment. 911 has been called. There is no bleeding, and I'm going to ask Robert if he hurts anywhere. This is called the chief complaint. I'm going to go ahead and move this bicycle out of the way here. Robert, do you hurt anywhere? Yeah. Where do you hurt? On this big bruise. On the big bruise down here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down there and address these bruises on this leg right here. Yes. Okay, so what I'm going to do is look and tell me. You're talking about right here? Yes. So what we want to do is we want to address this leg first because that is his chief complaint. Now, when I'm looking at this bruise, it could just be a bruise, which is internal bleeding, or it could actually be a broken leg. The three ways we determine if somebody has a broken leg or a broken arm or hand is mechanism of injury. Now that is, Robert fell off his bicycle and he's been hit by a vehicle, and that could certainly lead to broken bones. 
Number two is swelling. If Robert has a swelling area right here and it does look like it's swelling, he could have broke it. And number three is point tenderness. And that is if I touch this. Does that hurt when I touch this? So I'm not gonna touch it anymore, but I might immobilize this leg. We might splint his leg using sticks or, or, or towels or phone books or any way that we can. We may do that to prevent movement of bones. When somebody has broken a bone in their arm or their leg and it moves around, there are blood vessels inside. And when those bones move, it could very well break those blood vessels and he may bleed internally. As a matter of fact, this bruise right here is an indication that he is bleeding internally. The bruise here is due to bleeding inside his leg. And as the blood leaks out of the blood vessel, it turns dark or black or red like this. So I'm going to go ahead and address this. We may splint this area here, which we're going to show you later. I'm going to ask you, does this leg hurt right here? No. Okay, good. Then I'm going to go ahead and straighten out this leg. Let me know if that hurts here. And I'm going to go ahead and straighten that out. Now, I've addressed this. I'm going to make sure that he immobilizes his leg and he doesn't move it. I'm going to address from head to toe, make sure that there's no bleeding. And now I can go back and start at the head and work my way down. Some of the signs we see that somebody has been injured can either be blown pupils or fluid coming out of the nose or ears. This fluid is called cerebral spinal fluid. Now typically what happens is if somebody has a head injury, the brain swells and it will push this fluid out of the nose or ears. Do not stop this type of bleeding because the brain is swelling and if you close this off, it's going to put undue pressure on the brain. We can also look at Robert's eyes here. We're going to look at his pupils. If those pupils are equal, if they're the same size, that's a good sign. If one has blown or it's bigger, it could be a sign again of head injury. So we want to be aware of that and note that for the emergency medical service when they get there. So I'm going to look around the head for bleeding. I'm going to look in his nose. I'm going to look in his mouth to see that, that there's any broken teeth. Any broken teeth in there? Do you hurt anywhere in your mouth? No. Nope. I noticed that he has a bruise right here. That's something that's very, very important to indicate here. I'm going to check his shoulders. Now, when you check for broken bones or dislocations, you want to look at the top here. Typically, what happens with children when they fall off their bicycle, they'll put their hand out like this. And when they put their hand out, the shoulder will come up, the big bone here called the humerus, and it will move up high, and you'll see a divot in there. So I want to check for dislocated shoulders. I'm going to come down, and I'm going to palpate. Palpate means to touch. When I check Robert for broken bones, what I'm doing is I'm wiggling his arm back and forth, and I'm making sure that his bones are nice and sturdy, and I'm making sure that there's no bleeding. And I'm also taking note as to whether he has any pain or not. Now, when I get down to this arm here, and I get down to his hand, I can do a couple of quick checks here. I can actually take his, one of his fingers or his thumb, and I can press on that thumb, and the thumb will turn white, the fingernail, and then I can let that go. If blood returns to the fingernail after two seconds or less, this is an indication that Robert's got good circulation. That is, he's not going into shock. Typically in shock, the blood will pull to these areas and this capillary refill will be longer than two seconds, three, four, or even five seconds. So I can certainly see that his fingernails are doing good and that I push the blood out and it returns back in two seconds. Robert, do you feel me touching your fingers here? Yes. And that's a good indication as well. He can feel me touch his fingers and that's telling me that he doesn't have any nerve damage in this area here. So now I'm going to go down through the chest here. I'm going to look at his stomach, make sure that there's no um, bulging or anything like this. If there's any bulging in the stomach, that could be an indication that his muscle tore in his stomach and one of the large organs is trying to press out. I'm going to do the same thing with the other arm. I'm going to come down. I'm going to palpate that arm here and I'm going to check capillary refill on this hand. And then do you feel me squeezing your finger? Perfect, he does that. And now I'm gonna do the same thing with the leg. Now I'm gonna be very careful about the uninjured leg, or the injured leg, I should say, in that I don't wanna hurt him any worse because that will increase anxiety. So again, I'm gonna go down. I'm gonna make sure that this leg, just let me know if this hurts here. And then what I can do is I can ask Robert on this uninjured leg here if he can push down on my hand. Go ahead and push down. Perfect, and then I want you to pull up. 
Now, by doing this, by having Robert push his foot down and pull it back, this is also letting me know that he has got no nerve damage in that his spinal cord, his, his, his brain, everything is working well, and he's able to move his toes, move his foot back and forth. And, of course, do you feel this as well, Robert? Do you feel me squeezing your toe? So he feels that. So our best course of action right here is, is that Stephanie's going to maintain this spinal immobilization on Robert's head. We're going to immobilize this leg because of a possible broken leg. We can't treat any bleeding because Robert's not bleeding. And all we can do now is comfort Robert and wait for the emergency medical team to get here. So when we're back to Robert here, if we think that he broke his leg, the best way, the best course of action is just to keep it immobilized until emergency medical services get there. They've got the professional splints, the inflatable splints, that they can immobilize this leg, immobilize Robert to a board, and transport him to, um, to emergency services. But if you have time or you're camping and you can't get emergency medical services up to you, you may have to do something. You may have to invent a splint. Certainly it's simple enough to purchase a splint. This is called the SAM splint right here. The concept of this splint here is that it's aluminum with padding around it. And what you can do is you can just fold this over and make it as rigid as you want. And you can run this along the broken bone. Now the idea of splinting is to immobilize the bone so that the bones don't move back and forth and cause any further damage and also pain to your victim. So the concept is, is that when you splint somebody, you want to immobilize the bone or joint below and the joint above. So if we thought that Robert broke his leg right here, which is the tibia and the fibula, and then this is the femur right here, if we thought he broke a bone here, we want to immobilize his foot all the way up to his hip. And the same thing if he broke this bone right here. So what you would do in this case is you would make this as long as possible. You could put this on the inside and wrap it around his foot. You always want to splint bones and legs and limbs where they lie. So if he had broken his bone, and let's say that it had turned out this way, you don't want to straighten it out. You never want to move that part. You always want to splint it. And if you have to use padding to splint this, then that's what you want to do. So you want to move it as little as possible because there'll be great pain, and also it can cause bleeding. So we can use the SAM splint and put it in this way. Now certainly, if you don't have something like this, then you can use something that you can find around the house whether it be towels or phone books or, or blankets or even sticks in the backyard that I'm going to show you here in a moment. You could even use the other leg as a splint. If you're going to use the other leg as a splint, you want to pack towels in the center here. You want to put towels here because what's going to happen is if I use this leg to splint this leg, I'm going to move this leg over towards, so you always move the unaffected leg over towards the affected leg. And then the towels will help fill in the gaps here. And then what you want to do is you want to tie these two legs off. Keeping in mind, of course, if you're camping and you need to get out of there and you splint both legs, it's going to be difficult for Robert to walk. So sometimes it's better to use other splinting material. So in this case, I'm going to use a stick that I found out in the backyard. Now, if I see that he's got this injury right here, I always want to place the splinting material on the opposite side because you don't want to put the splinting material on top because obviously that's going to cause a lot of pain for Robert. So I'm going to go ahead and put this stick in the center here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some wrap material here. I'm going to take some, some gauze or triangular bandages. I'm going to move this here first. And I'm going to go ahead and set these under his leg. Now notice that I'm taking these triangular bandages or these bandages and I'm sliding it under his knee. There's a natural gap underneath his knee so you don't have to lift up his leg. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to scissor these down into different parts of his leg so that I can use to secure the splinting material. So I'm going to go underneath here. I'm going to go up here. And I'm going to make sure and secure this in at least three different places. It's very important to make two ties right where that break is as well. So I'm going to take note where this is, and I'm going to go up a little bit higher so I don't go on that break. Now I'm going to go ahead and put my splinting material in there. And then what I'm going to do is when I place this down here is I'm going to make the tie. Now you may want to run this around the leg two times. You can actually make two, two passes around the leg. And then when you tie this off, you want to actually make the tie 
right on side on the side of the splinting material and the reason you want to do that is because if I make this tie up here it's going to put pressure on his leg so the tie or the knot should be right on the piece of wood or phone book or blanket or material that you're using so I'm going to go ahead and make these ties here and then the second one is going to be here and again you may want to loop this around two times to make sure that it's going to be secure I'm going to make that tie here. Are you doing okay, Robert? Yeah. Okay, good. You always want to talk to them. Let them know what you're doing. Don't surprise somebody with something that you're going to do, especially when they're this age. They have a lot of anxiety. They want to know what you're going to do, and really they want to know if it's going to hurt. Now, that's something I can't really tell them because I don't know if it's going to hurt, but you want to be careful anyway. So I'm going to make a couple of ties here. Now that I've immobilized this leg here, I should take, the, should take the pressure off of him moving back and forth and maybe make a little bit of less pain for him and uh, actually a little bit safer as well. Now after you make this splint here, you want to make sure that he still has feeling in his toe. When I did the initial assessment, I found that he could feel me squeezing his toes and his, hand, and his fingers as well and he had good capillary refill. Down here on this foot here, I want to make sure that he can feel his toe still. And the reason I want to do that is because once I put this splinting material on there, I want to make sure that I didn't do something that's going to cause him not to have feeling in his foot. So once you do something, check it out. Make sure that he's still got feeling and things are still working good for you. We might even take Robert's sock off and check capillary refill. Now because he broke his leg here, I would expect him to have a delayed capillary refill here and that the vessels may not be circulating as well through this leg. So we might expect that when we push his toe, if we take his sock off, I'm going to go ahead and pull this sock off here. If we pull this sock off, we might expect him to have a capillary refill of maybe three or four or five seconds. So always check that before and during and after you do procedures like this.